Welcome to those here in person, but also a special welcome to those online. We see a lot of new faces in the house. We hope and pray that you will have a beautiful time with us today. Thank you for being here. Please stand for a scripture reading. It will be taken from Leviticus 23, reading from verse 30, 39 to 44. Leviticus 23. Also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And ye shall take you on the first day, and ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days, and ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute for every year in your generation, forever in your generations, ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites are born, that are born shall dwell in these booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God, and Moses declared unto the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. Here ended a portion of God's holy world. Please remain standing for our opening prayer by Brother Bill Fox. Please remain standing. A great creator God, we come before your throne in the throne of Jesus Christ and give you thanks for the invitation that you've given us all. Father, we pray and ask for your blessing upon this Feast of Tabernacles here in New York and around the earth where brethren gather to worship you, to learn more of your truth, to learn how to apply the truth in our daily lives. And Father, once again, we just ask your blessing on the services throughout the course of this feast and on this holy Sabbath day, the first day of the feast, we pray that you would inspire the speaking, that you would give us ears to hear, to understand, and that you would pour your Holy Spirit out, that we could drink in your word. So, Father, we give you thanks for these things. We ask your blessing upon the proceedings and that all the transmissions going out to the brethren online could all worship you and stand in awe of your greatness. So we ask this blessing now, and we do come before you in the name of our coming King, our Savior, the firstborn, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bill. As he mentioned, the transmission going out, for those online, we had a pretty rough week in terms of weather here in New York, so a lot of persons were delayed coming in. So please keep us in your prayers, and also we will keep you in our prayers. Please remain standing as we'll now go through the hymn session. We're now gonna have the hymns, first of which is gonna be hymn number 105, Come to the Feast. Hymn 105, Come to the Feast. The words will be projected, so please join me in raising these hymns.
Ready? Yes. Are you in the feast mode, brethren? Oh, yeah. Our second hymn for today is going to be hymn number 206, Behold, the Day Will Come. Hymn 206. shall be one God. Are you ready for that day, brethren? Uh, you don't sound too sure. I'll ask again. I'll ask again. 
Our final hymn for this segment is hymn number 39, Wonderful Words of Life. Hymn number 39. <laughs> Wonderful words, wonderful words. Are you here to have a wonderful time in the Lord, brethren? That's more like it. I told you I'd ask again. That's more like it. Well, if that was too slow for you, well, we have a very rhythmic session right now. So please make sure you are stretching and feeling the godly feast fever because we're not going to have a praise and worship session by our dear sister Celia and sister Kadeen. Sister Celia. Oh, and also, oh, we have a new member to the group. And our beautiful sister, Sister Melissa. Welcome. Happy feast, everyone. Ah, uh, no, you are good. The words will be projected, so please help us sing along. Sing along. Lord, you are good. 
He's coming back again. I believe that His Spirit is with us. I believe that He gives us power. I believe that He is the Son of God. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. Do you believe it? I believe in the life of Jesus. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. You may be seated, brethren. Are you guys warmed up now? Yeah. Are you still cold? No. Are you enjoying the New York weather? Yeah. <laughs> I hope you're having fun in the Lord, brethren. I, I um, purposely didn't mention the theme because I wanted you guys to believe that this is the best feast ever. Amen. The best feast ever. So this uh, year's theme is, I believe. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Amen. These are not my words. These are the wonderful words of life. So welcome to those here in person. We have a, a few new faces in the house, I see. We've, um, we welcome you. The true New York spirit welcomes you, Bridget. We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. So welcome to Fishkill, Pokipski, New York. At this time, moving down on the program, we have a, a young man who is going to make you see things from a different light. We have a young man who is going to end, end, what should I say, enlighten you with wonderful words of life. So for today's sermonette, I invite to the podium, brother, our dear friend, Robert Giovi. Happy Sabbath all, happy feast. Everybody doing? Hope everybody came here. Safe travels, everyone. A little bit of messy weather yesterday, but it seems everything has turned out just fine. Looks very bright and sunny in here, I can say. So, uh, like we said uh, just previously, that uh, the theme for this feast uh, is, you know, I believe. And as I was preparing this sermonette, I, I have to admit that slipped my mind. I didn't realize that was the theme, but as things do happen, um, it does seem to have had a little bit of destiny here that that's what I'll be focusing mostly on today. So we'll be uh, touching upon that a little bit now. So as we know, guys, today is the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, a glorious, glorious time. And um, I ask, you know, why are we here? You know, why are we here? And I know a lot of our sermons and sermonettes start with that question, why are we here? And obviously we're here to celebrate a future event 
uh, that will be like anything else in the course of human history. This, this will be something that has not been seen ever. Uh, and we are here to celebrate the first uh, day of the Feast of Tabernacles because we're commanded to be here. It is commanded that we come here, that we show here, and um, that's part of the reason. But it doesn't answer exactly why we are here. Uh, we are here to fulfill a plan and the counsel of God that he has ordained from the foundations of the earth. This is something that has been in the process. As uh, uh, last week on Dave Tolman, uh, Elder uh, Roper gave a sermon about the foundations and how this stuff has been uh, part of the plan before. This you will see also connects to that. So I'd like to speak to you all today about the Israel within Israel. This is going to be a little bit of a different take on the Feast of Tabernacles and its connections to the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, the remnant of Israel, for those who aren't familiar, refers to a group of people within the nation of Israel who remain faithful and believe to God and his commandments. I believe that this group of faithful people has been there from the beginning, like a linear line going through the scriptures, surrounded by, as we're going to see, an apostate Israel. And for those who don't know apostate, the apostate means those that have turned away from beliefs, those who have turned their backs on God. And this linear line from the very beginning, from Adam through Seth, right, to Enoch, to Noah, all the way down eventually to Moses, to David, right, to the prophets, all kept this very linear line of this remnant that kept true to God's commandments and believed. And we're going to focus a little bit on that today. And while being surrounded by the apostate nation, this remnant, uh, all the way up to the nation of Israel, uh, even has been found, I believe, that can, can connect it to the very people within this room today. And that's what we're going to be focusing on. So let us turn to 1 Kings 19, verse 10. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10. 1 Kings 19, verse 10. So here in Kings, 1 Kings, we see the prophet Elijah, who is fearing for his life from Queen Jezebel, if we're familiar with the story, uh, the wife of King Ahab of Israel, the northern tribes of Israel. So 1 Kings 19, verse 10, it says, So he, Elijah, said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. And as we can see in here, this is the prime example. This is the star, right? We see the apostate Israel. Who is the apostate Israel? They are the ones that have killed the prophets. They have always been the enemies of God to this extent. And as we see, uh, Elijah is fearful. And notice what God says. We're going to skip down a little bit here uh, to verse 18. Notice what he says here, how God responds. God says, yet I have reserved 7,000 men in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So within all of Israel, we see here, God has kept 7,000 men that have stayed true and have not committed back uh, idolatry to the pagan god of Baal. These men are example of that remnant. We're gonna see this little foundation here. They are part of the remnant of Israel within Israel. So turn with me to Romans, and we're gonna see Paul speaking to the Gentile church in Rome, and he backs up what I'm saying here, uh, and he's going to add a little bit more of a, uh, an important connection to it. So go to Romans 11, verses 1 through 5. So Romans 11, 1 through 5. So again, Apostle Paul speaking to Rome. I say then, has God cast away his people, Israel and Judah, right? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people from whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scriptures say of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does this divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed to the knee of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, watch what he says, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So we are seeing here, Paul speaking to Rome. That remnant that was left in Elijah is still in Rome at this time. There's still an election there. And what is it connected through? God's grace. So Paul is saying here that that remnant is there, and we know that God's grace all right, is given to those who have what? Faith, that believe. Not only just believe, but they keep the commandments of God, and we're going to see and believe in our Messiah, Yeshua, right? The testimony of Jesus Christ. That is going to be this bond. Turn with me to Ezra, chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9, 7 through 8. 
So Ezra, a priest of the second temple, right, is speaking to Israel and Judah. And he's going to state and add to this element here and add to this section of grace. Ezra 9, 7 through 8. Some days since the days of our fathers have we been in great trespass unto this day, speaking of apostate Israel. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hands of kings of lands to the sword, been conquered over and over to captivity as a spoil, to the confusion of face as it is this day. They're still doing it. They're still being an apostate. And now for a little space, grace had been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in this holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. So again, we see here the same thread of this theme of the apostate Israel coming up. But God keeps a faithful remnant of people who not only believe, but they also help with this is very important. Now we're going to start to see this other thing. They're going to start to deliver Israel out of bondage. Please keep that in mind. So not only is the remnant faithful, but they're there for a purpose. They're also helping Israel be delivered from bondage. Let's turn. Jeremiah 23, verses 1 through 6. Jeremiah 23, verses 1 through 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastures. So now he's speaking to the shepherds of Israel, the people who are supposed to be taking and giving part to the people in Israel. They're supposed to be helping us, they're supposed to be helping the people of Israel. That declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall feel no more, nor be dismayed, nor is it shall be any missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, while I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And in the days of Judah, they will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And in this name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Now you might be thinking, hey, this is a messianic verse. This is a a prophecy that usually people use for Christ. And so you might be asking, is this the remnant or is this the Messiah? And I say yes to both. I believe that this is being continuously continued. And it's going to see there's a pattern that God is using about the remnants. As we just saw in Ezra, what does the scattered and the uh, remnant do? The remnant delivers from bondage. And we're going to see here, apostate Israel is scattered, but the remnant saves Judah and Israel, which delivers Israel and Judah. Um, And now we're going to skip a little bit down. Actually, we're going to go to Isaiah, chapter Isaiah 1, verse 9, to build on this theme a little bit more. Isaiah 1, verse 9. Except the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Now, we all know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. They were devastated, right? They were completely taken out because of what? Their lack of ability to follow God's laws. They were, uh, you know, a Gentile city around there, and they were not keeping up with God. They were destroyed. But notice what happened. The theme of the remnant is all over especially in the Isaiah, on the scrolls of Isaiah, we're going to see this. And the remnant is special, so special to God, and that if it wasn't for them, God would have destroyed the entire covenant community. He said, Isaiah said it there, if it wasn't for the remnant, they would have been destroyed. The remnant takes on a sort of messianic savior role for Israel. As mentioned in Ezra, that remnant helps deliver Israel from bondage. So are we seeing a pattern here? Are we seeing a type And when apostate Israel turned their back on God of Israel, and they went into captivity, into bondage, who went with them? Who who went with the apostate Israel? Who suffered with them? Oftentimes, the remnant went with apostate Israel into captivity, into bondage. So the suffering remnant would eventually help them redeem. So we're also seeing them take on another messianic form, that the remnant suffers along with Israel, but yet helps redeem them. Does that sound familiar? We, We should be seeing this pattern here. And this is all very ironic. Why is that ironic? Because the remnant helps deliver the nation of Israel, but yet apostate Israel only continues to kill those of the remnant. 
So we're seeing a pattern here that even Christ is going to talk about, and it didn't stop even up until the time of Messiah. Let's turn to Luke 11, verse 47. Luke 11, verse 47. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Right? We see Christ speaking now at this point to uh, the tribes of Judah at this point, to the apostate Israel, that for doing the same things that was done in his time, right? Did, did all the prophets of old. And unfortunately, up until that time, as we know, even to our Messiah. Now, I could show you dozens and dozens of scriptures uh, in, you know, in the scrolls that are referenced to God speaking of the remnant. And they are, they're fascinating. They, they are uplifting. Um, I can't go through all of them. It would, it would be too much. Um, but what is incredible is that that Israel within Israel is not just limited to physical Israelites. The remnant of Israel is not limited to a specific ethnic group, but rather includes all those that have faith in God and keep his commandments. So let's turn now to Isaiah 11, uh, verse 11 through 12. So we've seen this pattern. The Israel within Israel helps deliver Israel and Judah and is taking on this messianic, uh, messianic role. Now watch how it is tied in even to this very room, as I was saying. It shall come to pass in that day. And when you see in that day in Isaiah, that's usually code words for end times or in the future prophets. So in that day, that Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the, si and the islands of the seas. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Like here we see Isaiah speaking again about the future remnant. But what do you notice this time? These nations are not just Israel, right? They are Gentile nations and not just the Gentile nations. These are the nations that have been enemies to our God and our, of Israel for all time. And he's still going to justify and bring them in. This remnant has been extended. We have been grafted not only into Israel as we know, but that specific remnant of Israel, which is, this is very special. This is extremely special. We read previously in Romans 11, when Paul discussed Elijah and the 7,000 who were left. Let's go back down, back to Romans 11. We're gonna go back down a little verse further. Let's continue to see how that remnant has been extended to us. Romans 11. And we're gonna read 11 through 20 here. And again, remember, now Romans, uh, another Gentile nation, you know, I, I am Italian, so you know this might have been my forefathers here, these uh, Gentile Romans, a lot of Italians here. So we say here, 11 through 20, I say then, have they, the apostate Jews, stumbled that they should not fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, through Judah's fall, through the apostate Israel's fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles, to us. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, if their fall is bringing out this marvelous blessings and their failure riches to the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? Don't think that God is, let's not fall into this idea of replacement theory. Let's not fall into that God keeps his covenants. He is not going to forsake Judah and Israel. That He will keep these promises. They will be redeemed. But for now, because of that fall, he is working with us to branch us in, as we're going to see here. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who my flesh, we, we, through our knowledge of the scriptures, we should be provoking those of the Judah, of the nation of Judah that we know, Jews that we know today. They should be hearing us speak of the Old Testament. They'd be like, how do you know these things? How, how do you understand Isaiah? How do you understand the covenant? We should be provoking them to jealousy of the knowledge that has been given to us through the Holy Spirit at all times. My flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away as a reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be life from the dead? For it is the first fruit is holy, which is them. They are God's first fruits. We have been crafted into it. They are first. The lump is also holy. They're holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of those branches were broken off as they were cast off, and you being wild, we are the wild olive trees, grafted among them, then we shall become partakers of being the, of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against those branches. Again, do not cast them off. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root. They support us, right? Israel supports us. 
You will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be hardy, but fear. Notice what keeps us in this remnant. What's the theme of this tabernacles? Belief, faith in our Messiah, our Yeshua, and keeping the commandments. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians, verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians 1 through 5. Here we see Paul speaking to the church of Corinth, another Gentile church. And notice the language here. Notice what the words, you know, it's, when you read through this stuff, it, it, you know, it, it's got to make you feel something. I, I hope it does. 1 through 5. So he's speaking to another Gentile church. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers... He's calling all these Gentiles of the Greeks. Whose are their fathers? The ones that we spoke of, Moses, the Exodus. They are now our fathers who were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate that same spiritual food. All drank that same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. Unfortunately, they didn't know. They didn't understand. That rock was Christ. Amen. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. The apostate Israel, it was there in the wilderness. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Why were they scattered? For disbelief, right? Those are our fathers now. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the, apost uh, the prophets, they are us. However, these apostates were then today, and Israel does not believe, but we do, right? We believe. So who is the remnant now? 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. We're going to see another metaphor here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Coming to him as to a living stone, our Messiah, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. And look what he says about us, brethren. You also, as living stones, we are a type of messianic figure are being built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, those of us who are baptized and taken that plunge, had hands laid on us, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable through God, through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is contained in the scriptures. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, our Messiah, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, you, you, us, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone, a stumbling block, and a rock of defense, the apostate Israel. They stumble, being disobedient to the word, to which they were also appointed. They were there, from there, from the beginning. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, which this is what Tabernacles shows us. This is the time of this priesthood taking place. We will be teaching his own special people, that you might proclaim the praises of him who called us, you, out of darkness, into his marvelous light, who were once not people, but are now the people of God. We were wild branches, but now we are the people of God, who have obtained mercy, but now have obtained, who have not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. This remnant of Israel within Israel, we have been grafted in. That's why I could easily say, we are that remnant now. We are connected to these people. And it is though that the belief of Messiah Jesus, which binds us to the prophets and the patriarchs, that is what keeps us on that linear line. Notice that Christ is that living stone. And Paul calls us, those who have been grafted in, that living stone. Because we are also that messianic figure to Israel. We believe, while apostate Israel does not. Uh, verse John, uh, chap book of John, chapter 20, verse 27 through 29. We're wrapping up here soon. John 20, verse 27 through 29. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. That, brethren, that, that is us. We have not seen the Messiah physically, but yet we are here, right? We have not seen him, but 
I don't know about you, you know, when my friends ask me, Rob, why do you do these things? Why do you keep these Jewish holy days? Why do you not eat pork? Why, why, you know, why do you do these things? And I hope everyone here, it, it's hard to explain to a certain extent. Yes, we follow the scriptures, but there's something that I feel. There's a connection to something bigger. And I hope all of us here feel that. There, there is something. And we have the faith so much so that we're here, right? We came away from our homes, traveled far distances, and, and this proves something to God. It's, it, it's important to him. And, and we should never forget that. Brothers and sisters, we are the remnant of Israel. We have been called into this remnant, this ancient remnant. And this is my last uh, verse here. I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, 17. We're going to look at an end time vision of Israel and put this all together here. Revelation 12, verse 1, first, I'm sorry, Revelation 12, verse 1, then we're going to skip down to verse 17. So Revelation 12, verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with sun, with the moon under her feet, and her head with a garland of 12 stars. This, as we know, is usually the vision uh, pertaining to Israel, the nation of Israel. And between verses um, 1 and 17, we see Satan wanting to destroy that nation of Israel, who was described as the woman. And verse 17, we're going to skip right down. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, the nation of Israel. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, the remnant, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is not until verse 17 that we clearly see this picture of the woman being identified as Israel, the remnant. And in the King James Version, it actually says, with the remnant, remnant of her seed. This means her offspring, which is identified in 17, who keep the commandments of God who was born to the woman early in that chapter. Israel, the nation, did not keep the commandments of God, as we know, nor does the testimony of Jesus Christ. They don't, they don't have it. Apostate Israel, as we have always seen, never does. Therefore, that verse 17, it shifts from Israel, the nation, to the church, Israel of God, the remnant. We saw previously that the remnant takes on that messianic figure for the community of Israel and Judah, which makes them part of the remnant, believing in the Messiah, Jesus, right? That's what makes it ironic, is that they both reject Messiah. But we do. We keep him. We believe in him. And Matthew 24, 22 says here, you don't have to go there, very one sentence. Matthew 24, 22. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, but that those days will be shortened. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we, we are special in God's eyes. Amen. Who we are, you know, it's almost like who are we that we get to take part in this miraculous divine plan. It's, it should be humbling. The great God of heaven, the creator of the universe has looked down upon us yeah. and said, I, I want him, I, I want you. And that should at least make us think we are in a plan that's bigger than us. Yeah. And at times like this, it should be humbling, but it, in the Feast of Tabernacles, we should be rejoicing Amen. in this. Yeah. Let us be of good cheer, our Messiah, our rock, who we believe upon has overcome the world and apostate Israel. And that faith that we have in Yeshua, just like the prophets, connects us and binds us to our fathers who were the remnant and has now transferred to us his divine church and the bride of Christ, which we are. And we celebrate here that wedding. And brothers and sisters, that wedding can't come soon enough. That's, that's what we are here for. So happy Feast of Tabernacles, brothers and sisters. May you be blessed. Thank you, Brother Rob, GOV. Uh, indeed, didn't you guys see it from a different perspective? Just as I said, <laughs> I mean, growing up, you hear about antonyms, synonyms, onomatopoeia, um, metaphors, personification. Can you guys guess Brother Rob's profession? <laughs> Anyone? Can you guess his profession? He's a teacher. Indeed, I hope you guys learned something today. Thank you, Brother Rob. Thank you. At this time, um, so we know we're not supposed to come before the Lord empty-handed. So I'll now invite to the podium our dear Deacon and our friend Deacon Carnegie with today's offertory. Okay. 
Happy Sabbath, everyone. And our dear brother hit it right on the head that uh, on this special Sabbath, we must not appear before the Lord empty-handed, use modern day language. And so it is that um, when you think about it, this is having a, a two for one Sabbath, isn't it? We have both our weekly Sabbath and our special annual Sabbath, and it doesn't get any better than that. But uh, there is the commission that spreading the gospel and his work must go on. And so we are here to participate in that process by our offering collection. And so I stand here before you with you in seeing it, whatever it is that we can do in getting the gospel and his message out. So please join us in our offering collection as we commence, Brother Richard. It's not just a story, it's a living, breathing, walking testimony. Sure. Of a God so good, he leave his home in glory for the world he loved, for the world that he so loved. Hey, it's not just a story. Yeah. I believe in the life of Jesus. I believe that he conquered death. I believe in the resurrection. I believe he's coming back again. What a glorious day is going to be when he comes back down here and we know we have done our part, our effort, our support in spreading his good word. It is that feel of knowing well done. Thank you, and um, let us all rise. We say a word of prayer. Merciful Heavenly Father, Almighty God, Father, brothers and sisters of faith that are here today, recognizing that your work must go on, we must do our path, our path, the part that we are here for, Father, to give you thanks and praise and that your work will continue by our own individual and collective participation in that process. Bless the offering that we collected today, Father, that it may indeed become a part of the collective effort to spread your gospel word. Bless each and every one of us here today and the powerful messages, one of which we heard already, and getting ready for the continuation. Bless those who are not here, but endeavor to make their way here, Father, or wherever they may be, that they too are participating in the process, Sabbath keeping, and the joy of the Feast of Tabernacles. Father, we ask all these blessings in the mighty name of our soon coming Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I will. Okay. Oh. Okay. Let me hand it back over to uh, the handsome gentleman of ours. <laughs> Thank you. You may be seated, Bridget. Thank you. Uh, brother Mark, I was looking forward to hear our dear brother Bill Fox, but I know we'll get the chance to hear um, his instrumental play. Usually we have that beautiful song played um, while doing the off offertory, but we'll get the chance to hear, hear from our dear brother. Um, he's a very talented young man, and also his wife is very talented too. This very pamphlet that you guys have in your hands, it was designed by our very own sister, sister um, Jamie Fox.
beautiful stuff. As I mentioned before, we have wonderful words of life. Words of life in the form of sermonet. Words of life in the, in the form of offertory. But now, we're going to bless you with a special item by our dear sister, Kadeen and sister Christine. Wonderful words of music. Happy Sabbath, everyone. As per usual, please listen to the words, not the voice. <laughs> not the voices. <laughs> trumpets sound the angels sing the feast is ready to begin the gates of heaven open wide and jesus welcomes you inside tables are laden with good things oh taste the peace and joy he brings he'll fill you up with love divine he'll turn your water into wine sing with thankfulness songs of pure delight come and revel in kingdom love and light take your place at the table of the king the feast is ready to begin the feast is ready to begin the hungry heart he satisfies offers the poor his paradise now here all have the amazing goodness of the Lord. Sing with thankfulness, song of pure delight. Come and revel in kingdom, love and light. Take your place at the table of the king. The feast is ready to begin. The feast is ready to begin. Sing with us. Thank you. We thank you. For your love. For your love. For your joy, for your joy, Jesus, Jesus, we thank you, we thank you, for the good thing, for the good thing, you give to us, you give to us, sing with thankfulness songs of pure delight, come and revel in kingdoms of and light, take your place at the table of the king, the feast is ready to begin, the feast is ready to begin, sing with thankfulness songs of pure delight come and revel in kingdoms of light take a place at the table of the king the feast is ready to begin the feast is ready to begin the feast is ready to begin How was that for a medley? <laughs> I was going to say, Merry, Merry Feast of Tabernacles. Are you guys feast ready? Are you in the feast mood? Is the feast ready to begin, brethren? Amen. Indeed, that was beautiful, sisters. We loved it. At this time, we'll have the announcements and we'll go into our main message for today. So please invite... I now invite to the podium our dear Elder, Elder Roper with the announcements and also today's sermon. Elder Roper. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's a, a good thing to be in the spotlight, but I don't care for it. Mark, this light has to be on. <laughs> This didn't bother you when you were talking? Yeah. Video. All right. Where's the camera for the video? Yeah, what's up? It's quite bright. All right. So I'm doing a now one. I'll introduce myself for those that don't know. My name is George Roper. I work with the church 
here in New York, amongst others, doing the same thing. My view of the world is a little different. You'll pick up on it as I'm speaking. Nevertheless, I am about to give announcements. I don't think announcements and the sermon should go together. I came close of walking up here and just like, stop, right before they sang. But I was told to go with the flow. So I'll go with the flow. Dessert and dinner, you know, you don't put it on the same plate. I always had a problem with like having candied yams with like my rice and the meat. It doesn't go together. But I was told to go with the flow. That being said, I will mix dessert and dinner. I was <laughs> thought I was coming up to give the sermon. But I have announcements. And some of those announcements have to do with some things that we have planned for the week. We have a boat trip where we're going to get on a bus, go down to the city, and sail around. Yeah, I see people shaking their heads. Because last year, we did the same thing, and it was tumultuous. <laughs> it was. The boat was rocking. It was raining. The, 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 the sea was, it was angry. But we made up with the sea. It's not going to be like that this year. On Monday, which is the boat trip, it's going to be sunny. The sea is going to be calm. It's going to be near 80 degrees, and the sky is going to be clear. It's the perfect night to have a boat trip. So it, it may not have gone well the first time, but don't let that dissuade you. How many people here have more than one kid? Like, you didn't learn your lesson the first time? <laughs> you keep having them. I do not have any children, but from what I've heard, there's joy in that. So I encourage people that may have felt the boat trip didn't go as smoothly and were thinking about skipping it, don't do that. You, you, you may actually have a better time. Secondly, we also have another trip back to the city to see The Lion King. Uh, it's a Broadway play, if you haven't heard of it. And it uh, is, if you've never been to a Broadway play, it's not like going to see a school play. It's, it's there's special effects and there's a, a lot of other things involved that make it very impressive. So please consider that as well. We would have transportation going down to do that. We would also have sign-up sheets following today that will be over here, and we're going to have service every day at 11. And so there will be sign-in sheets for both those activities, and you can sign up if you'd like. The boat trip is $75. The Lion King is $125. If that posed a problem for those that may not have it, we will make accommodations. So. The bus down, that's also, there's no charge. And for the Lion King, we would have vans to transport us. If you know of others that uh, are not interested in quote unquote church, they're still free to come on the boat trip. And if you know of others that are not associated with quote unquote church, they're still able to come to the Lion King. So if uh, you have family and you wanted to bring them, by all means, please do so. And that is the summation of announcements. And now I will start the sermon with a request. I think I left the water back there. You could, could you help me out with that? Again, for some of you that may not be familiar with me or familiar with us, thank you. There's a degree of something that's not orthodox in the way we may come across and the way we present. And I think that's what makes us unique, if you haven't noticed, by the music or the way that we seem to celebrate or even applaud the speakers. But nevertheless, Nevertheless, the, the, the message is still there. The understanding is still there. The instruction that will come from God is still there. It's just dressed a little differently. That being the case, we're here to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And we have to recognize that God has a way of introducing things that people are not accustomed to. 
We have our own way of thinking and understanding. And we oftentimes assume that the way we think, the way we process the world, that those that communicate with us will do the same. Approach us in the way that we think. Speak to us in the way that we talk ourselves, because that is how we take on understanding. But there are occasions where you realize you have to translate what you're hearing into the way that you would understand it so that you are both on the same page. And many times we do that with each other, with languages and culture, but we find ourselves doing that with God. We have to translate because he doesn't think the way we think or talk the way that we talk. That being said, God's way of viewing the world, God's way of, of recognizing what we're celebrating here today, it, it's a little different than what we're accustomed to. And in fact, it's on a higher plane than how one would view the most positive views of humanity, how humanity sees things, how humanity interprets being positive and being happy and being thankful. That degree of positivity that humans hold is still full short than the way that God looks at things. God has a, a, a reality that's different than man's high, highest form of being positive. Yeah. Yeah. Now me, myself personally, and the way I view the world, I am told oftentimes that I'm a pessimist. I, I do not think so. Instead, I keep it real. That's how I view the world in the way that I think. I keep it real. I, I, I look at the reality of what's happening. I interpret it in that way. I combine it with what's happening around me, and I come to a decision. And when it comes to looking at God's way of life, we take the scriptures and we combine it with how we live and what's happening in our world. We too keep it real. In preparing for the feast, there was a, a, a lot of accommodation, accommodations that had to be addressed. And in so doing, there were roadblocks that were hit. Many on the way here encountered literal roadblocks because of the weather. And because of a number of things that happened, it made it difficult to come here to celebrate, to recognize God's feast, to recognize God's days. In participating and contributing to getting the feast together there and, and, and trying to coordinate things, there were a lot of letdowns or disappointments or difficulties that I had to assume or absorb, perhaps absorbed more personally than I should have. And in so doing, it can be frustrating. And yet, everyone is here to have a good time. Everyone is here to, to be thankful and smile and look forward to the kingdom. And so, for those that may know my disposition, before I came up, I was told, bruh, don't go up there and, 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 and pull all that dreary stuff. When you go up there, be positive. Yeah. Everybody's happy. Everybody's trying to have a good time. Right. When you go up, smile. And we're going to get to that. Cut it out. <laughs> when you go up there, smile and, and just try to have a good time. Be positive. And my response, uh-uh. I'm going to keep it real. And so it is my intention as I speak to keep it real as we look and recognize what God will be doing here and focusing on the kingdom and what we have to look forward to. Indeed, the kingdom of God is something to be happy about, something to celebrate. We can see in Luke chapter 8, verse 1, there's something about information or things that are worth celebrating which is what brings us here today. We have information, we have an understanding that's worth celebrating, but again, the world's way of being positive is short. I'm going to keep it real. And in approaching this from God's point of view, there's a, a degree of appreciation 
and joy that will trump the level of human positiveness that is often exhibited with things related to human life. You'll get happy because your team won the football game, the Super Bowl. There's positiveness there. Or, or even we look at certain benchmarks of expression in, 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 human, in the human realm and how we interact. So you see people such as Mother Teresa, they, they, they hold a, a certain view, but even that, that level of expression is not enough to cross over into God's way of life and to cross over into the way that God sees the world, to be able to translate God's way of thinking and mentality and behavior by giving to the poor, by, by being uh, kind of demure, if you will, in your ambitions. It's not enough. There's another component that is necessary. Having God's spirit to couple with your mind to change the way you think, to change the understanding that you absorb in reading God's word, to apply what you have learned and how you behave and how you think and endure the troubles that come from that and then repeat that whole process. This is the Christian way of life, and it holds a degree of positivity that trumps a human approach, hence keeping it real. So God's way of keeping it real, of looking at the world, of, of being happy and celebrating something, we see chapter 8, verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The good news, something worth celebrating, good news is, something is different about this news. As ascribed by the author, the human that wrote this, in this case Luke, as ascribed by those that continue to write these passages over and over, copy them so that it could be distributed for wide release. And as attested by the ultimate author, God himself, there's something good about this, something worth celebrating. But you, we can also recognize that good news to you is not good news to the person next to you. It's not good news for everyone. Human positivity says, my team won, I'm happy. Human positivity also says, well, my team lost, I'm, 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 I'm not happy. Everything that we celebrate, oftentimes there's someone else that cannot appreciate it. So even the good news that we celebrate that does involve the kingdom of God and Christ's coming reign and the government of God being replaced and mankind having the ability to relate to God and connect to God. And I could just go on and on with these descriptions because it's complex. It's more than just that. It, 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 there, there's so many themes that overlap. Good news is good for a number of reasons. And it isn't just the surface recognition, it goes deeper. When we look at food and we look at culinary approaches, when you eat something, someone may ask you, what do you taste? And whatever is the most dominant feature or flavor may be what you quote, may be what you answer, but that's not all that you taste. Oh, I taste cinnamon, assuming it's good news to you, assuming you like it. I taste cinnamon. And but you ignore the nutmeg unless you study it, dwell on it, think about it. So then cinnamon is good news to you. If you don't like cinnamon, oh, this is nasty because I taste cinnamon. Good news is not good news for everyone. Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. Here we find in the future our present. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. The wise people, the people that are that continuous, ongoing remnant in the history of man will understand and appreciate the good news that we're here recognizing today. The good news that was spoken about by Luke Good news that you would appreciate from God's point of view and God's approach to keeping it real. Recognizing what's truly 
and most important, as opposed to the human view of being positive. The human view of, the human view of being positive takes God's kingdom and puts you in Disney World. Now, God's kingdom is better than Disney World. But yet, you may find yourself in comparison, figuratively, in Epcot Center, in front of the Magic Kingdom Castle, with a rodent and his girl, Mickey Mouse and Minnie, and all their compatriots. Because everything is just lovely. Everything is beautiful. Everything is just working out so well, and it's magical, but it's not real. Pessimism. It's not real? Uh-uh. Keeping it real. It's not real. Keeping it real says Disney World's view and presentation of happiness and utopia is not real. But God's kingdom is. And that's more than just uh, hyperbole. It's more than just pulling yourselves up by the bootstraps. It's reality. It is keeping it real. And in keeping it real, those that follow and understand God and those that are moved by God's spirit can understand and appreciate the value of what we're celebrating here today and that good news. An example of such we could see in Ruth. Ruth, the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth uh, is a short narration about a woman that became a part of a family that was uh, from the tribe of Judah and Bethlehem. They were Israelites, this family. This woman married one of the Israelite sons that immigrated to her country. An Israelite man during a time of famine in Israel decided he would move his family to a heathen nation and start over. And in so doing, he had two sons and those two boys took on women from the area, heathen women, Gentile women from the area. They worshiped other gods. They lived in another way. This man, he passed away. His sons, they passed away, leaving his wife and two uh, daughters-in-law. And so we, we have the matriarch, Naomi, left with her two daughters-in-law, and things weren't going well, and she was deciding, I'm going back home. This is not working out. And she told her daughters-in-law, you guys could go on back to your lives, go back to your gods, I'm going home. But one daughter-in-law had a different plan, and her plan was to be committed to Naomi, to her mother-in-law, but to God. And in this narration, Ruth is pictured as a type of church. And so she is committed to finding God, looking for God, searching for God, pursuing that truth that we spoke of earlier that seems to just pull at you where you have to respond to it. And so she returns back to uh, the, the land of Israel with Naomi, and they are rather destitute. They are women. They are not breadwinners in the society of that time. It was an agricultural society. But it, 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 you, you really needed a, a, a male role in your family to bring in an income. And without that male role, you would be challenged financially, which they were when they returned. And so there was a financial assistance program that was in place by God's command, where when people would uproot food from the ground, gleaning, they had to leave a little behind for those that didn't have. Naomi no doubt explained that to Ruth. And Ruth now understood, well, I got to get food for myself and my mother-in-law. I'm going to go out and glean. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to go to the public service office, and I'm going to ask for assistance because I am in need, and I could benefit from those food stamps, those, those other means of uh, bolstering our income, our intake, and that's what is happening. And so Ruth goes out and does that, and she gathers wheat, 
barley, things of that nature. At this point in time, wheat is being gleaned and is often compared to the church uh, being selected during the times of Pentecost. And so she now comes home with what she picked up. She's now coming back after getting off the bus coming from the social service agency and getting those benefits to suit their needs. And we now turn to Ruth, chapter 2, verse 19. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Because Ruth came back with more than what she was supposed to. Can you imagine someone goes to the public service office? You go to, to the public assistance office. You go to DSS or whatever acronym may be used that represents that agency in your locale. And someone asks, well, how much did uh, public service give you? How much did public assistance give you? Oh, I, I got $5,000. You What? Yeah, I got $5,000. Oh, that's just today. Tomorrow I'm going back for another 10. Well, who wouldn't want to sign up for public assistance? And so Ruth is looking at, or rather Naomi is looking at Ruth, and she's like, what happened? Where did you glean? Because you have too much. And her interpretation was, blessed be the man that noticed you. Like, somebody must like you because you come back with all of that. Ruth continues to explain. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I work with today is Boaz, she said. Naomi replies, the Lord bless him, exclamation mark. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. Her response is, that's amazing, great. And if you understand the society and the culture, she's happy, she's excited. She just heard good news. But you have to understand the society to understand why she's interpreting it to be good news, why she's so excited. And hence, good news is oftentimes interpreted by the degree of understanding that one may have. And so we're here today, and we recognize what we're celebrating is good news to us. It's something that's important. It's something that's real. But you have to have a, ter a certain understanding in order to accept it, process it, translate it into how you think and understand. Ruth, or rather Naomi, given the input that she just has, uh, that she was just given, as she processed it, she's now excited. She is now elated. And she's going to explain why to Ruth. And in turn, Ruth herself will be happy too, if she understands. You may take your happiness and you may take your joy and the person next to you is not going to feel it. Likewise, your team won, but the other persons didn't. They're not going to feel it. And you may take this truth, this understanding that you have that motivates you so much so that you came here to listen to God's word being taught, preached, discussed, whereas someone else may not have wanted to come with you. Someone else may not have found this entertaining, appealing, or beneficial. But you may, and perhaps you may even more tomorrow and next week, as you process this and understand and appreciate good news, if you can understand it. Naomi goes on to explain to Ruth the name of the man that she was working with. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Something to be happy about. A guardian redeemer was also a feature and a component of this social justice assistance program. Related to this public assistance program, a guardian redeemer was someone that took on the debts that you had and paid it, that took on the shortcomings, financial shortcomings that you had, and made it so that you could have a standard of life that you would find appealing. That's what the guardian redeemer did. So if your husband died and left you barren and destitute, and you have bills, you got a mortgage, you got a car note, you know what? You don't even have a job. You're not working. The guardian redeemer comes. He puts food in your refrigerator. He pays off your house, your house deed. He pays off your car note. However, when he does this, that car is not his, it's yours. 
When he does this, the house is not his, it's yours. It's in your name. He pays everything for you, the guardian redeemer, and he gets nothing back in return. Nothing back in return. He does this out of his own pocket. Pays all your bills and takes care of your family. If you didn't have children and, and you're a woman, the guardian redeemer marries you, provides you with children, and all the money that is made from that point going forward is not his inheritance, it's your child's. He gets nothing for this, but he inputs everything. So Naomi hears this, they don't have any money. Naomi hears this, they don't even have any food. And here Ruth comes back with all of this food and like, all right, what's going on? And she hears who this man is, she's ecstatic. She's like, oh, we are about to get paid. It's on, everything is great now. She's ecstatic. She heard good news. Likewise, we hear good news and we are to be ecstatic, appreciative, if we understand what it is that we're hearing. In the book of Ruth, Ruth is compared to the church and Boaz, the man that is the guardian redeemer is compared to Christ. As the scripture says, Christ has redeemed us. He is our guardian redeemer. He put in everything and got back nothing but us. We can't contribute these things. We have nothing. He gave his own life as likewise, the guardian redeemer puts in everything he has in his financial resources because it's not a selfish mode of behavior because you're not going to get anything back you don't own the house you bought. You don't own the car you bought. You don't own how you're making the business prosper uh, that, that the family now has. It's not yours, it's theirs. But for them, good news. And that's what we have had, good news in Christ's role in redeeming us and making it possible, not only that we can understand what he's doing with us and take on his attributes and his way of thinking and living, but we can understand what he's going to do for the world. That's good news that Christ was preaching to his listeners that they perhaps could not have appreciated except for that remnant and that population that was designated to respond to what God was doing. And likewise today, this is that same good news. And so when Christ returns, that's part of that good news. That's part of what we are celebrating. Now, Many aspects in society, they have that degree of good news, that degree of what they're looking for that would make life ideal. Some look for seven virgins. In that culture, in certain ways of approach, you get seven virgins, well, you're happy, life is good, it's a beautiful thing. Another way of looking at it, people look for life, liberty, in the pursuit of happiness. Again, th 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 that status of what is ideal? What is the good news, the, the way I wanna live and on a human level? That's their good news. Here in, uh, in the States, you know, we look for a white picket house and a white picket fence, 3.5 kids. That, that status of what is good news? What do we need to be happy? To, to, to have that way of life that will make everything all right, to be excited about. Now, we have a problem, I may say, here, because in a first world country, we have first world problems, despite how you may view your financial standing, whatever it is, you have first world problems. And you have food and you have clothing, you have shelter over your head, and you don't anticipate anybody uh, dropping a missile on your house tonight, I would not think. The benefits of our, our standing in life right here. And so having first world problems, we turn and look at the kingdom and go, eh, that, that's poultry compared to the way I'm living right now. And it, make, it poses another problem. But remember, God's way of being positive, God's way of keeping it real is different than man's way, than man's level of positive viewing of the world and one's own circumstance. And so I'm making that differentiation there. 
that God has a way of looking at things that's different than how man does. And God's way of keeping it real. Being honest, though, and keeping it real is different than how man views the world. And so we are here today to celebrate that kingdom of God to come. We are here today to celebrate Christ's return. But at the same time, as I forewarned you, we keep it real. And, 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 and taking the Bible and looking forward to what God is doing. So with that being said, when Christ returns, what will the state of man be? Is everybody going to be like, all right, God is back. Yay. Quite the opposite. They're not excited. Their team didn't win. Welcome to New York, represented by the New York Jets. Team has a track record of not being very good. And so, who are you happy for during a game? The team that wins or the team that loses? When Christ returns, not everyone is going to have that understanding and be able to appreciate the good news, to appreciate what is now about to come. If you do not understand the context, then you can't appreciate why it's good news and what is about to come. Likewise, when Naomi came back and when rather Ruth came back and told Naomi what happened, Naomi was able to interpret this good news here. She's able to perceive what is coming in the future. We're saved. We, 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 we just had a financial windfall. This dude is checking out my daughter-in-law, and he gave her all his food, and he seems to take an interest in her. Oh, it's on. And so it was. They got married. Boaz and Ruth, picture Christ and the church. Picture that unity. Picture Christ coming back to this world. We interpret that as good news. Naomi was able to foresee all of that looking forward. And her response was, well, you go back to that man's field. You, you mess with him. Oftentimes, you see people do that in this world with a improper motivation. Oh, that man has money? A girl, you, you better make friends when you know you respond to him. Because they look into the future. It's even more relevant when it is a guardian redeemer, someone that is going to do you well and do you justice, that you would respond to them and want to participate in an engagement with them. Hence, the way that Naomi viewed what she was hearing when Ruth came back and how she looked at what was happening, looked at that good news and saw where the future was going, that is our future. That is how we are going to interpret things as we look at it and see this good news going into the future. However, we're keeping it real, but we still see the future. And, in so, and so in keeping it real, to answer the question I pose, what is going to be the state of man when Christ returns? Good news for us. Revelation chapter 8. And it's like, why are you turning to Revelation unless you're going to the end of the book? Because it's Feast of Tabernacles. Because we're keeping it real. Yes? Yeah. All right. Look at that. Y'all responsive and everything? <laughs> Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. We find that God approaches the world and has to break the world down and their, 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 their vanity and their pride to make the world understand that they need to recognize and respond to God. And in so doing, the world takes quite a beating, literally, figuratively, and in the personality and understandings and viewpoints of mankind in the environment. Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, the first angel sounded his trumpet, and what was the result? A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Verse 8, the second angel sounded his trumpet, and the result? A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The reason a third of the ships are being important and being destroyed is, well, the humanity at that time, well, the goods and services have been interrupted. The, 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 the transport of food is now interrupted, which will induce starvation and other issues. 
Verse 10, the third angel sounded his trumpet. And the result? A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. You see where this is going? It's getting bad. But when you understand the good news, you're able to see where it's going. But at the time, people that don't understand, well, they don't get it. But this is the state of the world, and you see it degrading as I'm going along. The fourth angel sounded, and the result, a third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. No light, no photosynthesis. No photosynthesis. Plants can't make any food. Plants can't make food. Then people don't eat. People don't eat. People die. You, you see where all this is going? Not appropriate for the Feast of Tabernacles, is it? Oh, I hear one. Yes, okay. But it, see, you, you don't just look at where you're at now. You look at where you're going. I had to do this yesterday when I was driving. I was stuck in the traffic. Yes. And it was nasty and it was ugly and the rain was falling. I saw people stuck in the water with the water up to their car. The car died. Police had to come and pull them out. And I'm like, who told you to drive into that? <laughs> but not for nothing, I was tempted to do the same thing and I would have found myself in the same situation. Oh. And so I skipped that. I looked forward. I don't want to get stuck. And I kept moving. And it was nasty, and it wasn't, it was hard to see, but all I could do was think about what it was going to be like when I got here, and I'd get out the rain. Yeah. Even as I'm there at the driver's wheel, I am being taunted, battered, pushed, encouraged, told, get off this highway. It's not moving. But if I did, the next highway I would get on wouldn't move either. It seemed like anywhere I turned, it was a problem. However, I realized if I just push through this, when I get through it, I will be able to move. The traffic will clear up at some point, a mile, two miles, three miles, four miles later. I'll get to where I'm going in an hour or two or three or four. But it's the future. So you can't just look at where you're at now, you look at where you are going. Amen. How many times have you had someone come and tell you, oh, I want to be a doctor, and they don't look like a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. Okay. Oh, well, have you? how far have you gone in school? Oh, I'm working on my GED right now. <laughs> and you may think, oh, this isn't going anywhere, because you're focused on the present and not the future. How many people got their GED and went on and got a law degree. A lot. But if you looked at them when they had the GED, you would think, that's not working. Because you're just looking at the present and not the future. So even though I'm going through all of this and everybody's dying, you look at the bigger picture at how Christ has already redeemed us. They're going to be brought back later. But that's the end of the week. I'm getting ahead of myself. You're watching the movie. The hero's going to win, right? So you just got to wait till the end of the movie. Hence, at this portion of the film, recognize where we are headed. Recognize how our guardian redeemer has brought us back and how beneficial things will be in the future. And that is the good news that we are celebrating only because we're able to understand and interpret it the right way. So what part of death and destruction did I leave off at? Uh, we'll jump back into chapter 9 and verse 5. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet and, dropping down to verse 5, what's the result? People were tortured. They were, and, and in so doing, the agony they suffered was like that of a sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death but not be able to find it. They're exposed to some sort of uh, chemical warfare. Continuing on and dropping down to chapter 9 and verse 13, the sixth angel sounded. And what was the result? Uh, verse 15, and the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill 
one third of all mankind. This is the world that Christ is coming back to. Yes, sir. The conditions that they're in, it's not, it's not looking good. It, the world is in a good state, not in a good state. Verse 18, a third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of a degree of warfare. This is the state of mankind. This is what Christ is coming back to. This is keeping it real. This is the beginning. Verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts and investing in, 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 in demon worship or, or, or looking for guidance from demons. The scripture and phrase may also be used to refer to uh, drug addiction and influenced by things such as heroin, PCB, angel dust, K2. These, these things can impact society and, and, and that scripture may be referring to either one of those two things or both. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. This is the mentality of mankind when Christ returns. This is their attitude. This is the way they're thinking. They're, they're not responsive. They don't understand the good news, despite God shaking them. And so they have to learn that. There's a progression. And you look at their state right now, and you think, oh, this isn't going to work. But that's not how it's going to end up. That's not the future. It doesn't stay here. And so the kingdom of God is about change. It is about things, yes, getting better. It is, that's what the good news is. It's going to change. That's what Naomi got so excited about. She was like, things are going to change now. When you see people get rescued, maybe they're, they're stuck in a predicament, uh, 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 a predicament that will result in death. They're stranded on a boat in the middle of the ocean. They're stuck in a cave millions of millions. They're stuck in a cave miles down from the surface of the earth. And something happens that makes them realize they're going to be saved. There's good news that their outcome is going to be different. Their present is going to change. And they're so excited when you see these things on film where people, where people are saved from those kinds of disasters, elongated disasters. They're excited, and that's good news. Elongated disasters of a human condition that may last 6,000 years where man is, just does things his own way without God's interference. And you hear that things can be different? That's good news. And today we recognize that things are going to change. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 23, we see the condition of the world at this time. Another viewpoint, as if revelation was not enough. Jeremiah Chapter 4, Jeremiah 4 and in verse 23, we find uh, Jeremiah has a vision. I looked at the earth and it was formless and empty and at the heavens and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains and they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked and the fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. This is what Christ comes back to. But it's going to change. That's the good news. That's the keeping it real part. Look at what the world is. Oftentimes you come to the feast and avoid, hey, everything is just amazing. That's what it's going to become. And that is how things are going to progress because they are going to change from what the society is now to what it will become when it is punished and how it will be after when it reconstitutes with God. It is going to change. That is the good news. Continuing on, 
Verse 27, this is what the Lord says, the whole land will be ruined, though I will not destroy it completely. Therefore the earth will mourn and the heavens above grow dark, because I have spoken and will not relent. I have decided and will not turn back. This approach will be taken, but it will not be left that way. Again, there's going to be a change. That's the good news. Things are going to get better. Things are going to improve. We see a change in Genesis chapter 1. When we were reading Jeremiah, Jeremiah expressed that everything was empty, darkness and empty. The same phrase, the same Hebrew phrase used in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was, or may be interpreted by the Hebrew, became, the earth became formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This was the status and the condition of the world when God, we see in this narration, God approaching it. It was formless and empty. Same Hebrew phrase that Jeremiah used, tohu, babohu. It was formless and empty. That's what the world is going to become when God finishes punishing the world for not recognizing God. But it's not going to stay that way. And we see how it didn't stay that way here in Genesis. God refurbished it. He refurbished the world. He reconstituted it. And he imposed not just surface level change. He imposed his government and his society back on it through Adam and Eve, through that connection where God was at one with man at that time. The world is going to become like this again. The world is going to change. The world is going to be restored. A change for the better. And this is what the Feast of Tabernacles is about. Good news, change for the better, being saved, and the world now being restored to the way it was, not just in appearance, because the world will be devastated, but in the way man responds to God, because you saw how man's response was. They still continued their thefts, their briberies, their fornication, their worship of other things, worship of other gods. They're not responsive. They don't care. So this is their attitude, and that's their surroundings. That's the way the world is looking. It's not looking pretty in appearance or in character, but it's going to change. It's going to be restored. God's government, God's character, God's way of thinking is going to be back on this earth. And that's the good news. We see some of that good news in Isaiah 65, verse 25. And this is where people usually are exposed to scriptures like this during the feast. This is, these are the things that they typically hear, oftentimes not associated with directly, the way the world will actually look when Christ comes back on day one. Day one, you, you, how do you think it's going to look? Everybody's like, all right, good times, let's celebrate. It's going to take a while to get there. And it's necessary. Man will grow to understand that God does care, that God is involved, that God is available, that God is even someone or something to be desired, that God is something that you want. Not the seven virgins, not the house and the white picket fence and the 3.5 kids, not justice and, 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 and freedom and the pursuit of happiness, not those things that we hear all the time in this world, not the 46-inch television, excuse me, that's rather modest, would have been impressive 20 years ago. No, what are we at now? 95, not the 95 inch TV. No, that's not what we're focusing on in all of those things. Something more now, something greater, something deeper that you can't appreciate without an understanding and hence the good news that implies change, that implies being saved, that points to a restoration of what it once was of how it used to be. Now I forget the date. I did designate it on my phone. I won't look it up. I think the date was September 16th. September 16th, 1992. I may have gotten the date wrong by a couple of days or a week, but I'm gonna go with the 16th for this. September 16th, 
1992, NBC decided to end their programming of Saturday morning cartoons. And what followed? The other stations began to do the same. To which, today, no more Saturday morning cartoons. If you have kids, they do not know about Saturday morning cartoons because they weren't exposed. If you are my age or older, Saturday morning cartoons, well, that was normal. On Saturday, if you were an adult, you weren't watching TV unless you wanted to watch the Super Friends, unless you wanted to watch Scooby-Doo, unless you wanted to watch Josie and the Pussycats. Now, a lot of people can't remember those shows. Most of the room here probably can. I could go on and we could just finish the sermon. I could just keep shouting out all the shows that, were, that, that was kicking back then. Nevertheless, lack of exposure makes it so that people can't understand what was in the past. And when certain things are removed and society progresses, they lose that exposure and they can't understand. And so that is what has happened in our society. And so children grow up and they don't have the same exposure and they do not relate to Saturday morning cartoons. They do not relate to looking something up in an encyclopedia. They will not know what an encyclopedia is. They might have heard of it, but they won't know what it is. Nor will they have one in their basement or in their homes, nor did any salesman approach their door to sell them one. That is gone. That exposure is not there. What they will have are new means and modalities of retrieving information, and the older way is gone. When we look at the animal kingdom, if you take the mother bird away, then they are unable to teach their young how to kill the prey, hunt the prey, and so forth. You lose that capability and that component of understanding, and mankind has been separated from God. But things are going to be restored to the way that they were. Saturday morning cartoons are coming back. That's what's up. And this, that's the good news. God's government is going to be reconstituted. His presence is going to be available again on this earth. But this time, mankind will be able to appreciate it and understand it. And so we see Isaiah 65, verse 25. We see scriptures that we are accustomed to reading and understanding during the feast, the wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like the ox and the dust will be there and so on and so forth. That, that, that kind of thinking and these are the kind of scriptures that, that people would look at. Verse 22 of, of Isaiah 65, no longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will the days of my people be and so on and so forth. These, these things were, are, you're accustomed to hearing, but you see the world has gotten to a, a point where there's even vegetation, there's even fruit. When we started out day one, there is no vegetation. There is no fruit. Everything is dead. There are no animals. There's no, there's no lion. There's no lamb. They're dead. The, the, the animals aren't there. The environment is trash, but it's going to get better. It's not going to stay that way. It's going to be restored. And so I start off from that point, because I'm keeping it real, and then to show you, this is where we're coming from, but this is where we're going, and it makes the arrival so much more impressive. Amen. It makes the good news so much more exciting when you recognize how you're about to get money and you're about to have a financial windfall. When you were poor before, well, it is a big deal to go from that to being rich, you appreciate it. When you're already rich and just a couple of more million dollars, does it really make a difference? It does to them, but in reality, I guess, what are you moving from? You don't appreciate it as much. Hence the problem of first world problems. You have first world problems, it's hard to understand. Not too long ago, I, I lost $300 through whatever way. And I was pissed. And I was recounting that to someone. And I'm telling them, man, I did not have it to lose. And his response was, yeah, but you had it. Well, what do you mean? I didn't have it. I had to pay $300 for something. Yeah, but you had it. 
I said, no, I didn't have it to lose. Uh-uh. Literally, you had it, else you wouldn't have been able to not have it. <laughs> and I got his point. I have first world problems. I'm like, man, I didn't have that to lose. Yeah, but I had it. I, had, I, was, I was a hundredaire, and I happen to have $100. Full disclosure, I'm a hundredaire, yeah. <laughs> Recently, I lost about $770. That hurt, but I had it. As I wouldn't have been able to lose it. And I'm still here moving around doing stuff because I'm a hundred air and I had to absorb that. You see what I mean? It's harder to understand things from a certain perspective when you already are operating from a degree of prosperity. To think of an even higher level of prosperity beyond our, our, our interpretation of what prosperity actually is. And so it's hard to make that jump to appreciate the kingdom. It's hard to make that, that to, to grasp the degree to which God's presence and impression on the earth will be felt and how it will affect mankind. Micah chapter four. Micah chapter four and in verse one. Micah 4, verse 1, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established at the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and people will stream to it. This is where it's going. This is where it's heading. And all nations, the picture as hills, will stream to that mountain, God's government, the center of the world at this point. And it's not Disney World. It's not Washington, D.C. It's not Rome. It's not Kingston, sorry. Um, it's Jerusalem, it's God's presence. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. They're going to understand. They will be able to appreciate that good news and that approach. This is the level of restoration and change that we're headed for. This is what we are celebrating today. This is the good news. Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, and in verse 16. Zechariah 14, verse 16. Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem, the people that are left behind after all of that destruction that we touched on on day one, the people that were attacking the, the remnant of God that had been changed into spirit beings, the people that were attacking God's return and that restoration that they can't understand is really what they want, is what they need. The survivors, those survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the king the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. If any of the peoples of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord Almighty, they will have no rain. If the Egyptian people do not go up and take part, they will have no rain. No rain, no food. No food you don't eat. Makes life very uncomfortable. And then you begin to go, okay, maybe I will recognize this God. The Lord will bring on them the plague he inflicts on the nations that do not go up to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. Initially, we looked at how the, the, the disposition and the character of the world would be on day one, and nobody's acting right. They're into idolatry and fornication and theft and worshiping other gods. They cannot appreciate God. And we fast forward and we see how the restoration takes place. And you see the change. And you see now this, this is going to be a compelling for people to return to God. People are going to learn this is what you want. This is what you need. This is how you change. This is how you go from GED to a graduate degree and a holding a law degree in a law profession. This is the progression. But it's more than just a change. It's more than just being saved. It's a restoration of what was already here before. Another point. This was here before. We're just going back to the way it was, the way it could only be. 
And that's what, that's the impression people will be left with. They will understand that. And it, they're going to be taught and coaxed. And they will learn to appreciate God. They will learn to love God. They will learn to desire God because God is going to operate with them in a manner that makes them closer, that brings them in, that helps them change, that makes them embrace God. Mark Twain has a quote where he talks about his father. And he says, when I was 14 years old, I thought my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. And yet when I became 21, I was surprised at how much the old man had learned, how much he was able to change. He was surprised at how much the old man had learned in seven years. The point is, the old man didn't learn anything. The old man isn't the one that changed. It was him. When you're 14, you can't understand life. You can't understand how your parents' decisions may be in your best interest. But when he became 21, it's like, wow, you changed. He didn't change. His father didn't change. He changed. The populist humanity is going to change. And they're going to be like, wow, you know this God? He's kind of all right. God didn't change. They changed. They were restored. They were saved. And this is what we're celebrating, that change, that restoration. Us, our friends and family, anyone that's on your cell phone uh, bill and extinction, they're all going to change for the better, to be able to reconnect with God. And this is the good news that we're celebrating today. Zechariah 8, verse 20. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Many peoples and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come, and the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let us go at once to entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. And many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him. Giant change in the people, in their thinking, in their desires, in their values, and what they think is cool and relevant and important and desirable for the better. That's what we're celebrating today. This is the good news. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. This is keeping it real in reality. Romans chapter 8, verse 22. Romans 8 and verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly. The world is in a state of being that is not what it was intended to be. And so are we at this moment, but we're looking forward to the future. We're not just looking at the present. You don't just look at how you hold your GED right now. You look at that future to graduate degree that we're going to have as we pursue a greater and deeper relationship with God and find how the world is impacted by such a thing. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, that change, not just in ourselves, but in the world at large, having the world be restored. For in this hope we were saved, saved, redeemed by our guardian redeemer. Being able to look into the future and see things are going to be better. Being able to be restored to what things once were. Ephesians chapter 1. We are recognizing why we are here today and what we're celebrating and why that's important. And so in the time that I've spoken, I kept it real. And after keeping that real, I'm pretty much finished. And I'm going to stop. I'll read one more scripture. So I'm just giving everybody a warning. You know how when you're eating a bag of chips, you need to let yourself know that you only got one chip left. If you're eating cookies, you need to let yourself know, okay, this is the last one. If you're drinking something and you didn't plan right in your head 
and you started to gulp it down and you didn't have any, it, it throws you off because you may have been enjoying what you were exposed to and it catches you off when it just stops. And so, I don't know how you guys were receiving this. However, we did talk about good news. And I'm going to stop after I read this last scripture. Fear warning, because I keep it real. Rome, uh, Ephesians chapter one and verse seven. In him, we have redemption through his blood. We've been brought back. Our guardian redeemer has repurchased us and paid all our bills, paid our sins, paid our debts at great cost, but to our benefit. And this is something to be excited about, something to be happy about, something to celebrate. This is good news. And we look forward to the future restoration that will be applied to all peoples in the future. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. These are components and made possible because of God's grace, because of God overlooking our sins after he paid them and allowed us to re be receivers of his spirit to transform our minds, the way we think, the way we behave, the way we're going to live, how we endure and, and, and stay committed to God. Repeat that process continually in prayer and study and living it out, enduring and repeating that process. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure. That mystery, that secret, th that good news is something we can appreciate and understand now, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, when that restoration comes, when that saving becomes more apparent. When that GED becomes a law program, then you see, okay, this is what it is. That's what it always was. You just couldn't see it unless you had that understanding. And that's what it is today. Not everyone can see that good news. Not everyone can see what we're celebrating today. But we can, and we focus on that and celebrate that Amen. as we keep it real and recognizing the Feast of Tabernacles. Amen. Thank you, Elder Roper. Hola. <laughs> Konnichiwa. Ciao. Namaste. Shalom. Bonjour. Wagwan. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter where you're going. When that day comes for us to hear the good news, everything will be kept real. So, Bridget, make sure you get the essence of the elder's message keeping it real. Thank you, Elder Roper. Please stand for our final closing hymns. We will have two hymns to close, after which we'll have the closing prayer by our dear brother and friend, Brother Denton Clark. Please stand. First off, which is gonna be hymn 168, I sing the mighty power of God, hymn 168. The words will be projected, so please join me in raising these hymns.
Lord, how thy wonders are display Where'er I turn my eye If I survey the ground I tread Or gaze upon the sky There's not a plant or flower below But makes thy glories known And clouds arise and tell Our final hymn for today is hymn number 163, O Worship the King. Hymn 163, O Worship the King. Let's bow our heads. Great God and Father, thanks for allowing us to come in your presence. And here we are to make it real by obedience, by the moves we make to become a member of your family, member of your team, your government. Now it's making it real. And as we stand before you today, we stand humble by the information you allow us to know. As we present our bodies a living sacrifice and come to rejoice before you at this feast. Amen. Continue to bless us in all we do. Give us the strength to go forward. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus to Christ, we ask. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his sweet and awesome peace. You are dismissed, but...